20 years on from 9-11, the Taliban is back in power. The fall of Kabul and scenes of chaos have raised many questions. Was the forever war worth it? What's in store for women and girls? And is Australia doing enough to help those in danger? Welcome to Q&A. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm David Spears. We're coming to you live from Melbourne tonight. And joining me on the panel, the CEO of the Australian Women, Muslim Women's Centre for Human Rights, Diana Syed. Afghanistan veteran and Victoria Cross recipient, Daniel Kieran. International security expert, Lydia Khalil. Nationals MP, Darren Chester, who until recently was the Minister for Veterans Affairs. The former Labor Foreign Minister, Bob Carr. And joining us live from London for the first part of tonight's program, the BBC's Yalda Hakim who brought you tonight's foreign correspondent. It is great to have you all here. And remember, you can stream us live on iView and all the socials tonight. Quanda is the hashtag. Please join the debate. We've had a very strong response to tonight's program. Many of you want answers on Australia's role in this unfolding crisis in Afghanistan. So we'll uh, also bring you a question tonight from the man known as Witness J, the former military intelligence officer who was trialled and jailed in secret over national security offences. Our first question, though, comes from Mustafa Afsali. I am a young Hazara, born in Afghanistan and fled to Australia in 2006. With the Taliban making countless vague and empty promises, such as not taking away the rights of women and girls from getting an education or having the right to work, simply because the whole world is watching them right now, what is the Australian government's plan once the Taliban reneges on their alleged promises, especially once the world turns away its attention from Afghanistan in a few days, a few weeks or a few months. Yalda, let me start with you on this. Uh, you have actually spoken to uh, Taliban representatives as part of that e extraordinary piece we saw tonight on Foreign Correspondent. Uh, and you also took an unexpected call the other day while you were live on air on the, on the BBC from a Taliban uh, spokesman as well, who told you there will be no revenge on anyone. Can the assurances we're hearing from the Taliban really be believed? Well, David, you saw that extraordinary press conference that the Taliban had a few days ago. Uh, it was very similar to what I've heard the Taliban say before. I, they said it to me on air. They said it to me face to face when I travelled to Doha. They said that women would have their rights. There wouldn't be any revenge attacks or reprisals. But I spent... Uh, the better part of three weeks uh, in Afghanistan a few weeks ago, and you saw that report on Foreign Correspondent. And I sat down with Taliban frontline commanders who are fighting this war at the moment. And I asked him uh, a series of questions, and he said to me, we want to return to the kind of rule that we had in the 90s. So when I asked about, for example, if a woman was accused of adultery, now adultery based on whose judgment, he said, well, of course we would have stonings. He said we would have uh, public executions. Uh, um, with, um, you know, use uh, sort of soccer stadiums to do that kind of thing. There would be amputation of hands and feet if someone were to commit uh, the crime of theft. He said, this is all laid out in the Quran. Uh, this is all part of our Sharia law. And if you want to live within it, great. If not, you'll fa face the kind of reprisals that you need to. So, Diana, what do you think about this talk of some sort of Taliban 2.0? Yeah, well, exactly that, David. It's just talk. The ideological sort of mentality hasn't shifted. What has is that they've got a very sophisticated um, PR machine now and they've now got social media at their disposal. Just because that they've got a spokesperson and they're able to use... Um, Twitter doesn't necessarily erase the ideology, um, their stance on women's rights, on how they will continue to persecute other minority groups and others at risk in the country. I don't trust anything that they're actually now spinning. Lydia, does the Taliban need international support, engagement more than it once did? Uh, do you, and, and indeed, do you think this is an organisation capable of reforming? Well, I think it's an important question, and I think the points Deanna made are, are spot on, is that, uh, you know, the best predictor of future behaviour is past behaviour. And we only have to look at what the Taliban mm -hmm. did in the 90s when they originally came to power. They said exactly the same things. They said there won't be any reprisals, we'll, you know, we won't go door-to-door, -door, our, our rule will not be brutal. Um, 
But then we saw what happened. You know, they governed according to this archaic and brutal uh, Islamic rule that, frankly, many of the world's Muslims do not consider as legitimate. Yes. And so, to me, um, they, we, can't, we should not be expecting any significant change. Yes. Saying that, however, um, they certainly do, for the time being, do crave international legitimacy. They need the aid that's mm -hmm. coming in. Um, and so they're going to be making the right noises at the moment. But again, their ideology hasn't changed, their vision for Afghanistan hasn't changed, and we shouldn't expect it to. So, Bob Carr, coming back to Mustafa's question, if once this global spotlight moves on, moves away, and we do see the Taliban revert to what we've always known about them, what then should countries like the US and Australia do? Well, it, it's got to be said that the rule in Afghanistan between 1996 and uh, 2002 was, was monstrous. There, there were massacres, along with all the institutionalised systemic cruelties towards women and girls. Um, there are two things we've got to focus on, given the, the limitation on any impact we can have. Uh, one is reopening our embassy as soon as possible and doing so moving in partnership with uh, like-minded countries, the Europeans, the Canadians. The Americans would certainly want us to have eyes and ears in Kabul as uh, resumed as soon as possible. Um, obviously, we've got to move as if the promise of international engagement will make the leadership of the Taliban aware of the impact on world opinion of any return to the abuses that they practised uh, so monstrously, so systemically, uh, 1996 to 2002. Uh, the other thing is to use our relationships with uh, certain nations in the Arab world, uh, with Pakistan, to um, send messages uh, to the Taliban leadership. Again, reminders that the world is watching. They can isolate themselves from the world if they want, but they will, there will be costs and penalties associated with that. But I know all this sounds pretty lame, well, uh, but the end of our military presence there means that our options are very much limited. Well, Darren Chest, let me yeah, just cut to the chase on that point. Uh, whether it's um, I engaging back in Afghanistan with an embassy, engaging Pakistan and other regional neighbours, is the bottom line even if we see human rights atrocities under the Taliban in Afghanistan, we're not sending troops back in. Well, David, I agree with your, your earlier uh, speakers that the Taliban will be craving legitimacy in the eyes of the international uh, community. Uh, but we have every right to be very sceptical about any change in behaviour. I mean, if we're going to see change, we need to see it now. And the first example of that would be allowing clear passage for people who are seeking to leave, who have visas to leave, who are seeking to access the airport and seeking to uh, be repatriated to a safer location. That would be the first sign that the Taliban is serious about uh, behaving differently this time compared to last time. But uh, I have no confidence that we'll see any improvement uh, in behaviour. So if we don't? Uh, the attitude towards women and children and minority groups. So if we don't, though, the bottom line is we're not going back in. Well, David, that's not a decision you can expect me to make as a, a backbench. You can have a view. Slam, you, can have the, a, you can have a the reason, but the reason, the reason, But the reason we first engaged in Afghanistan all those years ago, which I'm sure we'll get to during tonight's conversation, was around preventing it becoming a haven for basing global terrorism attacks. It, it morphed into a, a different role in, in following well, yeah, years and, we will and come it became in. a nation-building role to some extent. Mm. So uh, we're not likely, as we sit here today, to be talking about Australian military presence other than what we're seeing right now, which is that humanitarian effort to repatriate Australians and, and visa holders, people who have worked with the coalition forces mm. and, in fact, saved lives uh, on the ground in Afghanistan over these past 20 years by the work they've done with the Australian and coalition forces. And we will come to that, but Yalda, just coming back to you on this, is the Taliban aware of this reality that the US and its allies uh, are not going to return there simply because, or only because, of human rights atrocities that it might commit? Uh, yes, uh, they are aware of this. And the conversations I had with them in Doha and Afghanistan was that we are not going to turn Afghanistan into some kind of terrorist haven. Uh, the issues of, of human rights and women's rights, uh, that memo hasn't trickled down to the foot soldiers and the commanders. But one thing that has been passed right round is you make it clear that you in no way are affiliated with groups like al-Qaeda, for example. But we know uh, from the assessments of U.S. 
Intelligence, U.S. Treasury, the U.N., uh, that continue to put out reports as, as early as just a few months uh, that uh, the Taliban are still very much linked and protecting al-Qaeda in the country. I'm also getting reports from people who are in the provinces. They're sending me videos and, and photographs of foreign fighters in the country. Of course, as the BBC and as all journalists, we have to ensure that we verify the authenticity of those videos. But these are the sorts of things that are now starting to emerge, where even residents of Kabul are saying to me they're hearing mm -hmm foreign languages and they're seeing fighters from places like Yemen, Iraq, Syria operating in the country. So as, um, uh, you know, uh, Bob Carr said there, that we, it's, it's quite important that the international community at least has the presence of, of their diplomatic staff in the country as eyes and ears. Well, that question of what uh, is happening outside of Kabul brings us to uh, our next question tonight, which comes from Lida Hazara. Hello everyone, I'm Lida Hazara, the president of Women for Change Association. We run an education course for 266 girls in a remote place between the mountains in Afghanistan. It was like a candlelight in the dark night. All gone and vanished. Our teachers and students are hiding for their lives. There are many things behind the scenes that the world media cannot see. The world media just covered Kabul nowadays. In the past two weeks, Taliban killed artists in front of their families. They've killed many civilians in Malistan district. 20 more girls are missing. My question would be, why the Australian government not introducing an emergency humanitarian intake visa for women activists? and minorities similar to Canada and UK. Thank you. And I want to come to this visa question, but Daniel Kieran, let me bring you in here. During your uh, tours in Afghanistan, what did you uh, witness when it comes to the improvements in educating girls in particularly some of the provinces? Yeah, look, absolutely. To, to start with, let me, let me first say that as a veteran myself serving, I know there's a lot of hurt in the veteran community right now. Let me say that your service absolutely was worthwhile in Afghanistan. I know myself uh, doing two tours, spending some 16 months outside the wire, as they say. I was fortunate enough to see that change. From my first tour in 2007 to 2010, I saw the change in the smiles and the faces of the kids from, from going from where they were in 2007 to 2010 the uniforms, the infrastructure projects, there was a real sense the country was turning around, without a doubt. Uh, so it is quite disheartening, I know, uh, as a veteran that has served with the Afghan National Army, uh, that has fought beside them, that has lost mates on the ground over there fighting for human <coughs> rights, to see the scenes that are coming out of Kabul and Afghanistan now. So for those veterans, my message to you is pretty simple. Hold your head up high. You should be proud of what you achieved. Well, on the issue that Lita, ra Lita raises about uh, special visas, uh, emergency humanitarian visas, Diana, the Prime Minister has said there will be at least 3,000 humanitarian places for Afghans in this financial year. There may be more. Um, but is that enough? Should there be some sort of special visa given this situation? In short, absolutely. But I would also like to firstly acknowledge um, how much has transpired over the week. Um, and those Afghans watching at home tonight, those in the diaspora community in Australia and globally, um, I want to say, Afghans, I see you, I hear you, I am one of you. Um, and I would also like to show that um, there is palpable fear right now um, for those here in Australia, um, for their loved ones back at home, and for the rest of us who are reliving the past traumas of our parents and our families and their experiences of war. I also want to say mm -hmm. that there are very, there are other vital voices that are missing from the panel here tonight. Um, and I want to just make sure that people understand at home that us as Afghans, we have so much diversity and plurality that exists in our community. And I am mm -hmm. so honoured to know that our voices are being centred and that um, we are finally being heard. So second to your that question, yeah. I want to say that absolutely we have this week mobilised and we have had over 106,000 106, um, 106, um, 
people who have sent along MP letters. Um, we've had 96,000 people who have signed petitions and we've just saw the open letter that we signed on behalf of almost 10,000 people um, signed calling on the Morrison government to increase its intake. This is 3,000 in, that's already our in existing humanitarian intake. We need an emergency intake of an additional 20,000 um, visas to be granted to Afghans immediately. And that includes those who have assisted allied troops, translators and other personnel. Um, but this also includes women and children as long with their families. Um, we're talking about other at-risk groups, ethnic minorities, LGBTQI and others. Absolutely, unequivocally, we can do this. Australia has precedents. We've did it with the Syrians. We've done it with um, the Vietnamese, and we've done it um, before. So there is no reason why we cannot do an emergency intake for Afghans right now. We have a moral obligation to do that. Uh, Yalda, let me Should just. I start, uh, can I jump in there, David, quickly? I think there's plenty of reasons, uh, from my personal experiences on the ground. Mm. Uh, certainly the action that saw me nominated and later receive the Victoria Cross. The reason that it was so big, that, that engagement, was because the Afghan National Army commander on the ground was working for the Taliban. I have multiple stories from other veterans as well of their interpreters working for the Taliban, guiding coalition forces into IEDs. My caution around this is that as long as the correct checks and balances or checks are made, or background checks on individuals, is so important before we just open the floodgates. So, Daniel, you, you're, you're worried that some of those who work with Australia would do us harm. Is that what you're suggesting? They have previously, they have previously without a doubt. So why not? Why would they not do it again? I mean, I went to Afghanistan to fight the problems in Afghanistan. Let's not import those problems to Australia. But it is I'm, possible I'm, to do these checks. I'm that, that's the issue, isn't I, it? Sorry, I, Diana. I, absolutely unequivocally refute the, f the framing of that, Darren. Um, we are losing critical so political... Daniel. Daniel. Sorry, Daniel, Darren, David. Um, it's very... Um, it, we're losing critical political analysis here about how the Taliban came back into power. They do not exist in a vacuum. And that sort of security lens in which you're looking at Afghan, we are people. We have culture, we have rich history, we're poets, we're academics. <coughs> we are not just here to serve your purpose in a war. We have agency. And we are here to tell you that we are human beings worthy of being granted safety, just like anyone else. And seeing us through that security lens of refugees, of potential security threat to Australia is so reductive. You are flattening us as a people. And that sort of like, and also what you're saying there is that we don't have the systems and processes in place to vet people. So that also undermines the Australian processing system right there. Yalda, let me. Uh, yeah, sorry, I need to go to Yalda because we only have her for a short I, while I, longer. I just, yes. Yeah, I, I just want to jump, but I do want to jump in uh, on one point and, and just. I have worked in Afghanistan and I've been going in and out of that country for about 15 years. I started my career there and I did my first report for, for Dateline in Australia from there. I've spent that time with female journalists, civil society, activists, female MPs. These people had the options when the targeted killings happened to leave the country. They don't want to be refugees. Yes. They are currently leaving reluctantly. They want to stay in their own communities. They want to work in their own communities. Some of these people uh, speak, you know, the most incredible amount of English now because of the gains of the last 20 years. And you would have seen that now on your airwaves uh, across mm. Australia and across the globe. Let's just remember what has actually transpired here. These people were told, we'll fund you, We'll inspire you, we'll back you, we'll shelter you, we'll finance you. Come and join us as part of this sort of project that, that we're doing together, the Americans, the Western world, to, to sort of create human rights and democracy in Afghanistan. And then many of these people tell me the rug was pulled out from underneath them. So it's not that they want to leave Afghanistan, they leave reluctantly, but they tell me when a totalitarian regime has now overrun the country, they're concerned that this, as you saw in my report, and, and many commentators have said, is a sort of Muslim version of Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. And so they currently, many of them, including from the Hazara community, and there are so many of them in Australia, are now sending reports to the BBC, and I'm speaking to people on the ground who are saying to me, 
that they have said, seen with their own eyes young girls and women being rounded up from that minority uh, community, kidnapped and, and, and given away to these foot soldiers who have fought this war now uh, and need to be rewarded. Now, of course, we need to verify that uh, as the BBC, and we're working on that uh, as present. But it's, it's sort of not just about people who have led Australians, uh, you know, into IEDs. And, of course, there's been a whole host of, of issues. But you also have to uh, remember that 66,000 Afghan National Army soldiers died alongside mm -hmm. uh, both Americans, Australians and, and the British. And I've spoken to the U.S. Uh, uh, commander who led the forces in Afghanistan, David Petraeus. I've spoken to General McMaster. And he said some of these fighters were, and soldiers were, were some of the most courageous. They were our mm. brothers in arms. And, and so, of course, there's got to be a proper vetting uh, uh, well, situation that takes place. But you also have <laughs> to think about who's coming into the country. Sure. Well, let's just accept that it is possible to do security checking. Coming back to the numbers here, Bob Carr... Um, as I say, the Prime Minister said 3,000 out of the mm. annual intake will go to <coughs> Afghan. What, what sort of number would you suggest would be appropriate right now? Well, Canada offers us a good guide. Uh, Canada's taking in 20,000 with special humanitarian visas. Mm -hmm. um, this government has said uh, 3,000, 3,000 3, humanitarian visas. They need to clarify whether that's on top of the 13,750... No, it's part of that 13,750 they've uh, confirmed okay. today. Well, let's, OK, well, that, that strengthens my case for us to be more generous. Mm -hmm. So, if Canada, with a population double ours, is taking in 20,000, let's make, let's make a decision to go for 10,000. And I tell you why I feel we should err on the side of caution... I had this meeting in 2003 when I was Premier of New South Wales. We'd elevated, we'd elevated the teaching of ANZUS in the history curriculum and students were learning about it in year 10. And I hosted two high schools to the National War Museum in Canberra, which I, I saw, among other things, as a great teaching resource. Mm. And interestingly, from Holroyd High School, there were four Afghan background students. I'll never forget this. Two boys, two girls, year 10. And we stood... I was talking to them about Gallipoli and we stood there looking at that model of the, mm. the, landing, mm. the landing site of the Anzacs. And as I was talking about the withdrawal in December 1915 as the snow was coming down, uh, this girl, in Australia for 13 months via Christmas Island and Port Headland, actually completed my sentence. She knew the story of Gallipoli. She'd been in Australia from Afghanistan as a refugee for 13 months. So but Later on, we were having morning tea in a little conference room. We just need a, to move on from that if we can. But just well, I, I, just want to make yeah. a, I just want to make a point, David. I just want to make, make this point, one sentence. When we take Afghan refugees, we're not doing them a favour... We're doing this country okay. a favour. They make great citizens. Let me just put that 10,000 figure that Bob Carr has suggested <clears throat> there to you, Darren Chester. Uh, would that be an act of generosity or at least appropriate uh, response in this circumstance? Well, first of all, David, to be very clear, the Prime Minister, in his announcement today, said that 3,000 was a floor, not a ceiling, so he's anticipating that well, that number will increase. <clears throat> and to Dan Kieran's point about maintaining the security and the integrity of the system. That is critical to make sure the Australian people continue to have confidence in our refugee system. Now, Australians can be very proud of the fact that since World War II, we've invited into our country and a part of our humanitarian program 920,000 refugees. Australians have a rich and a proud history of supporting uh, refugee intakes, working with the diverse communities, and they've made an enormous contribution to our nation. So the 3,000 the Prime Minister announced today is a starting point, and it's on top of the people that have already come to Australia who assisted locally engaged staff, the interpreters, who already have visas. So uh, we can be proud of that fact. We shouldn't be talking Australia down in terms of the way we're endeavouring to do our bit, to do our uh, role in supporting that humanitarian intake. Uh, but, but as, but as, as, as others point out, though... So indicated, we need to maintain the integrity of the system. But, yeah, when we look at history, uh, the Fraser government took 50,000 from Vietnam, the Hawke government, 42,000 from China after Tiananmen Square, Tony Abbott, uh, 12,000 uh, from people fleeing Islamic State in, in Syria. Doesn't 3,000 sound a little on the low side? 
And that's David, within our the, the point the Prime Minister made today, and the point I just made, he indicated that was a the floor. That's a starting point. Okay. There's uh, in the order of eight and a half thousand Afghanis have come to Australia since 2013. Yeah. Uh, I understand so since that. April this year in terms of interpreters. Well, that was certainly an indication the Prime Minister gave today. But it's important that we recognise that Australia has a generous program. 13,750 people per year under the current program, which during this COVID period, we probably won't reach that target this year. So there is room to move within those existing right. targets and making sure that we're doing our bit. So I, I, I think that it's premature to be talking uh, negatively about a program that the Prime Minister announced today and indicated at that time There's more was a come. starting point. Okay. Our next question, we've got to move to that, comes from Masood Jouand. Good evening, everyone. My name is Juan, and I've got a question for the Afghan female panellists, Salamunu Gwandu. Uh, the question I've got is that segments of our community appear a bit more optimistic with the Taliban invasion. They cite the Afghans' need for stability overrides the small inconvenience of the burqa. I'm just wondering how statements like that make you feel. Thank you. Good old Paimon. Yeah, it's an interesting statement. Um, Yalda, let me get your thoughts on this uh, quickly. Is the burqa viewed as, uh, we heard there, a small inconvenience? Well, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, in my conversations with the Taliban, they haven't necessarily indicated that the all-face-covering uh, burqa is what they want to reimpose. They've told me there are various different kinds of hijab uh, that they would find acceptable. Now, for how long and, and, and when the sort of eyes of the world turn, turn away, whether that uh, is going to be the case. We've also seen in the last two days female presenter on television interview uh, a Taliban spokesperson in Kabul. Uh, we've seen female reporters uh, in Kabul out in the streets interviewing Taliban. Um, we've seen some schools reopen in Kabul. Now, what we have to look at, though, is what is happening in Kandahar, what is happening in Herat, what is happening in Mazar. And the young women uh, who I've been speaking to who showed up at the gates of their university in Herat were told, you're to go home, you're to wait at home until further notice. Herat University, 60% of the population within Herat University and the students uh, were women. And so there is a lot of concern mm -hmm. that those gains are going to be wound back and, and, and lost. Well, Yalda Hakim, we know you have a busy night ahead of you reporting for the BBC. So we're going to say thank you very much for joining us this evening and good evening to you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, thank let me you. come back to this question, though. And uh, Lydia, let me uh, come to you on this, because I suppose part of the question is, can the Taliban actually promise stability at all? What is its grip on power like and, and how stable is it? Well, obviously, this, these are very early days. It's an extremely chaotic situation at the moment, and we're going to start to see the situation um, not solidify until weeks and months from now. Clearly, the Taliban have an upper hand. They've controlled the mo majority of the, ta uh, the territory in Afghanistan. Um, you know, they have arms at their disposal, um, and they are presenting themselves as the political leadership uh, of Afghanistan to the world. So they do clearly have an, up, an upper hand in what's happening in Afghanistan. That being said, we've seen protests emerge in various areas in Afghanistan uh, to them. There are militia movements that are forming and anti-Taliban opposition for forces that are, that are forming as well. We don't know what their situation is right now, how they'll consolidate, what it will look like in terms of how or if they can oppose the Taliban, if there will be future negotiations. These are major unanswered questions, and we honestly won't be able to answer them in these immediate days of what's going on now with the Taliban. But I think, um, you know, the Afghanistan at the moment, you know, looking at past history, it's at its most heightened risk of civil conflict, I think, now and into the next year. And that's what we should be anticipating. Yeah, it's a troubling time ahead. Let's go to our next question, and it comes from Taz Majidi. My name is Taz, and I belong to the Hazara community group from Afghanistan. I came to Australia in 2013 as an unaccompanied minor to seek asylum because my life was in danger. That year, Australia changed its immigration policy for people arriving by boat, ensuring we never get permanent protection, nor will we ever be able to bring our family here. Almost nine years has gone, and I'm still living in limbo. My future is uncertain, but one thing I do know is that I will never be able to return under Taliban rule. So where does that leave me and my family back in Afghanistan? 
I am 25 years old, and I already have lost contact with my three sisters. Aziza, Habiba, and Najiba are human beings. They are smart, beautiful, and kind. How can this government, who knows the mind and terror the Taliban bring, just sit and watch as we experience yet another genocide of innocent people? Well, Diana, let me come to you first on this. Taz, we heard there, he's on a temporary protection visa. He's been on it for nearly nine years. The Prime Minister has made it clear there will be no permanent visas for those who did come by boat. Uh, we have received a lot of questions about this from members of the Afghan community. What is it like, as far as you're aware, uh, being on a temporary visa? What, what does that mean? Yeah, and I just would like to say thank you, Taz, for your question. I see you and I can not even imagine what that is like to be on a temporary protection visa in Australia, um, living your life in limbo like that. There are over 5,100 um, Afghans currently here in Australia living amongst us, working, shopkeepers, doctors, lawyers, working amongst us in our neighbourhoods who are on temporary protection visa. And that is also one of our calls in our open letter, in our petition. We are also calling for those 5,100 um, people who mainly from the Hazara minority group who don't have um, a pathway to permanent residency. Now, it is so important that they be granted that because it is clear from everything that has happened um, in the last week um, that the Taliban resurgence, um, they cannot be um, given much deference right now um, around this rhetoric that they are spinning um, and they should be granted permanent protection. Well, uh, Darren Chester, is it time <coughs> to give someone like Taz a permanent visa? Well, David, you know and, and I know how incredibly complex this issue has proved to be. And you are in the press gallery and I was in the backbench in opposition when question time was a daily report on the number of boats arriving unlawfully in our country. And what the Prime Minister has said and made it very clear, we won't be outsourcing our refugee, our humanitarian, our visa program to people smugglers. We won't give them a product to sell. But do TPVs do that? This question. I mean, there's, there's boat turnbacks and so on and offshore processing. But do TPVs do that? What we, know, what we know, David, from the last experience when we lost control of our borders under the previous government was that people smugglers are waiting for every small chink in our armour and to be able to go to the unfortunate souls who are seeking to travel and to sell them a product that they can come to Australia and they'll get permanent residency. And we saw people dying at sea and there is nothing humane about sending our Navy, our border protection people out to fish bodies from the water as they had to do when we lost control of our borders. We can't just, see that return. I would so, just like to correct that. I'm that's... sorry, the Prime Minister made it very clear the Prime Minister made it very clear today that people who arrived unlawfully will not be in a position to achieve permanent residency under this government. They have actually been determined as genuine, genuine refugees. They've already gone through the process and they, there is no pathway to them to permanent residency. Now, where is, the, where is the human rights in that? Where is the humanity in that, that these people have to live their lives in limbo, which means that they can't have family reunification, which means that Taz can't have his sisters, his parents, his, si his siblings come out to Australia? Where is the <coughs> dignity in that? I ask of you, I ask of everyone in Australia right now, how you could fathom living your life like that. Bob Carr, let me just get your thought on that. Yeah, yeah, David, I, I, look, I, I'm, I'm the first to concede that people smugglers should not be setting the pace in Australian immigration. It's a position I'd taken when I was in federal politics and I supported Kevin Rudd's initiative with offshore processing and offshore detention and boat turnbacks has worked, full marks to the Abbott government. With those policies in place, however, there's no reason to worry about an inadvertent message to people smugglers by doing, doing something that captures the generosity with which Bob Hawke moved in 1989 in the wake of Tiananmen. Letting them stay. It, yeah. seemed, it seemed almost flamboyantly generous at the time. Many of these students could have returned safely to China. But he didn't take the risk. He erred on the side of generosity. Mm. I am convinced from what I've seen of the Afghan community in Australia, Hazaras stand out, uh, I've met a lot of them, that there is not the faintest risk of the nefarious trade in, in, in human beings being resumed because after all these years, we legitimise 
the, the people who've got TBV status. Err on the side of generosity. These people have been fantastically successful additions to this country's multicultural strength. Legitimise it, while at the same time allowing the offshore processing and detention policy and the boat turnbacks to take care of the problem, a real problem. I, I don't retreat from that mm, okay. as people smuggling. It will not revive because of reform of... Right. T because of legitimisation of um, people with TPV. I okay. just want to just, say yeah. that, David, that I think it's, like, we have to sit here and constantly prove our humanity to be given our basic human rights. And we have signed on to the United Nations Refugees Convention. We have obligations at international law. And you can't forget that the Afghan diaspora that is in Australia right now, we have over 46,000 of us, 71,000 including our ch the children of Afghans. This is a, v a core constituency base. And our history in this nation dates back to the Afghan Kamaliyas that have come back in the 1800s. Mm. So we have been pivotal in nation building here, but we shouldn't have to prove our humanity. This is an international law obligation. Let's move on to our next question, which comes from Dave Peterson. As a veteran, I can't help but ask. After 20 years, 41 lives lost, and thousands of Australians wounded, both physically and mentally. Billions of dollars spent, and now, again, 20 years after 9-11, the Taliban are again the government of Afghanistan. Did we ever have a plan, to begin with, for any of the war? It is apparent that we certainly didn't have a plan to leave with dignity. The Anzacs at Gallipoli achieved one stunning success, and that was their withdrawal. All these years later, we still can't seem to get that right. Daniel Kieran, uh, let me come to you first on that. I mean, there's a couple of things there. Um, was it worth it? And, and did we have a plan? Did you feel there was a plan when you were on the ground? Look, without a doubt, uh, any veteran that's questioning their service, look, I've already said that tonight, it absolutely was worth it. Um, there was mission creep. We've already touched on that uh, during the program. The, the real reason we went into Afghanistan, let's not forget this, was bin Laden, was the terror camps, yeah, or the, the training camps, I should say. That is why we went there. Did we achieve that element of the, of the mission? Look, we did. And then the mission changed. Uh, and we started this nation-building uh, exercise I don't think we were fully ready for. And as a soldier uh, as a on the ground, that, what, how did that... How did that there's been many what did that mean for you? Leaders. Oh, sorry, I'm having some real issues with my comms. <laughs> sorry, I was sorry, just going to say, as a soldier on the ground, as that mission creep happened, what did it mean for you? For me personally, I mean, look, I, I had the opportunity to then take part in some of those rebuilding uh, exercises. You know, I spoke briefly before about the infrastructure projects. Uh, I wasn't part uh, specifically of that. Uh, I went in, in 2007 supporting special forces in, in the missions that they were carrying out. And later, 2010, and, and that mission was specifically around training the Afghan National Army uh, and, and getting them to a standard to look after the security of their country. There's a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges throughout that time, uh, certainly with, with corruption, uh, certainly with uh, some of the political groups and, and the things that we had to face uh, each and every day. Um, so, yes, there was a plan, uh, and then, then it changed throughout, and we didn't execute as well as we could have. Um, that's the reality. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing now, the scenes from Kabul. Well, what did you make of these scenes from Kabul? I mean, was this much of an exit plan? Daniel? Apologies. I've, I've, uh... I'm not sure if you can hear me there. I was just going to pick up on your final point there. What did you make of the scenes in Kabul this week? Was it much of an exit plan? Look, the scenes, without a doubt, uh, for me, look absolute... You know, it was terrible. Realistically, terrible to see... No doubt that individuals that I'd, I'd served with and trained with and fought beside the Afghan National Army fleeing the country. Um, I do question why the airport wasn't, wasn't secured. Um, let's not forget that the Taliban have always been there. They've been there for the entire 20 years uh, and they were waiting. They've been waiting to strike uh, and the US uh, exiting was their chance to strike uh, and they did uh, and we weren't ready for it. It's as simple as that. Darren Chester, you talked uh, to a lot of veterans uh, and their families as well. I mean, what, what, what do they feel at the moment about whether this was a, a well-planned exercise all along and, indeed, whether it was worth it? Well, there's a lot in your question, David, and, and, your, and your call's question as well. 
What I wouldn't pretend to do is suggest that every veteran is going to feel the same way about their involvement. Some will be frustrated, some will be angry, uh, some will be incredibly proud of what they were able to achieve. I encourage anyone who's uncomfortable or feeling like they need to reach out to contact Open Arms. It's a shirt I'm wearing tonight for a very good reason. That's 1800 011046 and they can get free support in that regard. But like, like Daniel was saying at the outset, no Australian veteran, no serviceman or woman who served in Afghanistan should feel anything other than pride in their mission that they are endeavouring to fulfil. They acted enormously with great integrity, with humility, with compassion, and also had to do a very difficult job. And they should be proud of what they did in, in their efforts to secure some form of peace in Afghanistan. Now, I, like you, David, in, in Kabul a few years ago, saw those young Australian men and women training the Afghan National Army officers at Karga, just out of Kabul. Uh, they were dedicated to the role. They were looking to secure whatever a Afghanistan form of peace might look like. But whether it was an intelligence failure over the last few weeks or whatever's occurred, the military clearly wasn't capable of withstanding the Taliban. And the speed with which the, the country was overrun, I think, took everyone by surprise. And, and those scenes at the international airport and the scenes we've been seeing on our news all this week would be disturbing for a lot of veterans. So I'd encourage you to make sure you reach out to your mates, call a few mates, see how they're travelling. I've had the chance to talk to a, a couple of family members who lost loved ones, both in Afghanistan, but also post the war, uh, people who, who lost the battle at home. And you know, they're feeling pretty bruised by what they're seeing on the news. And it's just important that people do reach out and support each other if they're having difficulty at this time. And Lydia, just to take us back 20 years, the decision to go in, was it justified? And was the mission clear? Uh, that's an important question, David, but I just wanted to kind of address the previous question as well. Um, you know, I got a sense from the questioner that there's this deep sense of moral injury among the veteran community. And that's palpable in the question, and it's justified. Because if you read the Inspector General's report on the Afghanistan reconstruction coming out of the United States, it was just released a couple of days ago, coincidentally, and it has an overview of that 20-year history of our involvement in Afghanistan. And it is a litany of failure and mistakes and missteps. There's a lot of blame to go around. I think that sense of moral injury among the veteran community, among people who care about Afghanistan, among the Afghan people themselves, is certainly justified. But to your question about why did we go in, was it justified, I mean, I think the causes belly for the war in Afghanistan was the 9-11 attacks. Mm -hmm. I can't envision an alternate universe in which the United States would not have gone in to Afghanistan after the most spectacular terrorist attack in world history and targeted... Well, there was strong bipartisan support in the United there States. There was incredible bipartisan... Well. Yes, yeah. there was. There was incredible bipartisan support. But as there time was, goes on... There's global support for it. However... You know, the United States went in. It was successful in pushing the, the Taliban out immediately. The al-Qaeda was almost routed, routed out of Afghanistan. But what happened was, of course, was the Iraq invasion. And we can't separate mm. our mission in Afghanistan from that, uh, that strategic misadventure in Iraq as well. Well, Bob Carr, let me just ask you here, because uh, as foreign minister... Well, you wrote, you wrote uh, your book, Diary of a Foreign Minister, and you recount a conversation with senior people uh, around Afghanistan. So this is what, back in a, around 2012. Yeah. You said, they agree that after 12 years, the whole war has been a waste. Was that the view behind the scenes at the time? Well, I, I remember vividly speaking to someone who I won't name, um, who headed an Australian security agency, who said if he'd been given millions of dollars in a, a suitcase and told to go up to... Uh, Orozgan province, he could have achieved the same result we achieved through our military intervention by bribing tribal chiefs. Now, I don't know enough about the politics of, of uh, provincial Afghanistan to, uh, to say whether that's right or not, but it is a challenging view. I think we're going to see uh, Afghanistan and Iraq as they settle into history as two colossal mistakes. Afghanistan, very different in reality from the uh, catastrophe of Iraq, far more serious than a misadventure. But I think we're going to see, history will, will see both adventures as being the, the excesses of the neocon movement in the United States. Uh, Wolfowitz and Cheney capturing control of American foreign policy, 
um, legitimised in their aspirations for American empire after the 9-11 strike and embarking on what they, they thought was the unipolar moment, a special opportunity to entrench American dominance and, on the way through, remake the Middle East. And intervention in Afghanistan, followed by, uh, God save us, a simultaneous and equally difficult war fought in Iraq was something that they believed within America's capacity. It wasn't. And the sense of restraint you heard in Biden's speech to the American people is very much the tone appropriate to this day. I don't believe... If Al Gore had been elected and only, only a single vote on the US Supreme Court prevented him being elected in the year 2000, I think he would have... I think, I think a President Gore would have taken out the training camps in Afghanistan, the Al-Qaeda training camps would have destroyed those and then never for a moment have been tempted by this preposterous nation-building mission that mm, kept us there followed. for 20 years. That's well, the truth of the situation. Well, there's also... Uh, it, it does actually bring us to our next question, which comes from the former military intelligence officer known as Witness J, whose identity remains suppressed. Uh, J served in East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan and was trialled and sentenced in secret for national security offences. So we obviously can't <laughs> identify him, but the, the question from Witness J, the veteran community's hurting deeply at the moment. I am hurting, he says. Our pain is only a drop in the bucket to what many Afghans are feeling. Before my deployment to Afghanistan a decade ago, our commanding officer told us Australia's involvement was to assure the US that we were a dependable ally and that once we left, the Afghan government was likely doomed to fail. Given this, he says, why couldn't our political leaders tell the country the obvious truth, that we were there solely to prove to the US that should the time come, we would fight with them so that they may intervene on our behalf in any future existential military crisis? Lydia, uh, is supporting the United States, supporting that alliance, one of, if not the main reason we went in? And is it a legitimate reason? It's certainly one of the, the main reasons that Australia's involvement in Afghanistan. It's not the only one. I think that Australia did have uh, legitimate concerns about international terrorism coming out of Afghanistan. Australian interests and Australian people have been targeted by um, al-Qaeda and international jihadists that came out of there. So I think they were both important reasons for Australia's involvement in Afghanistan to begin with. Um, and I think that they were both equally legitimate. But I think that once the mission creep started to happen, once we started to see the limitations of that military involvement, you know, the truth of that and the limitations of that should have been properly understood um, and factored in to Australia's involvement in Afghanistan. Daniel, let me just ask you on that. Is that why you felt you were there as well? For me, look, uh, that's pretty simple. I was there for the, the men and women to the left and to the right of me on the ground. It's as simple as that. I went, uh, they went, uh, we served our country the government of the day. Uh, I have no questions uh, at all of why we went or, or no issues for why we went across mm -hmm. there. Um, at the side of the program, you know, I said that I fought beside the Afghan National Army as well. For me, it was absolutely about uh, human rights. Uh, you know, those friends that I have or had whilst I was in country, the Afghan National Army. You know, for me, it was about creating a better tomorrow for them. Uh, so, yes, there was a number of issues throughout. That's without a doubt. Uh, I'm for one who's been in, in combat and situations like that, that every step that you could take could be your last. I'm not going to sit here and, and question some of the decisions um, that were made. But let's be honest, mistakes were made. Do you ever feel, though, Daniel, as though, w while you're on the ground there, that politics was uh, holding back what you were able to do, was getting in the way of, of doing what you needed to do? Politics or, or resources de depends on, on how you want to look at this this problem. Um, without a doubt, more resources uh, on the ground. I think our, our mission would have been vastly different to what we achieved. I think we could have achieved uh, so much more if we had the resources available to, to do that. Um, if I could interject yeah, sure. here, David, um, I think you know, with all due respect to the veteran community out there who are genuinely feeling this, and the pain is palpable, and they have also signed on to our petitions calling for the humanitarian intake. You know, they've been <coughs> platformed quite extensively, but I just worry about how the experiences of Afghans are once again being sidelined. We did not choose for this war to happen. It's an imperialist intervention that was unlawful in 2001 following 9-11. You're saying once that that intervention again, would have been better had there not been Look, an we, intervention? We just need to be 
are mindful of this narrative. It's very, um, like, it's it's become a quite simplistic and a binary between um, the Taliban and, and the intervention and allied forces. We can sit here and hold a multifaceted approach. We, as Afghans, can sit here and critique our own government for a plethora of reasons, for corruption or, you know, war profiteering. We can sit here and also critique the, the um, intervention and allied forces mm -hmm. and what has transpired in the last 20 years since the intervention. Yes, gains were made once that intervention happened, undeniably <coughs> so, that is a fact. However, since then, you know, we don't want the Taliban either. So we can have all of these, these feelings um, and as well. It's not, it's not, a, it's not one or either or situation. My point is, is that, you know, we have to actually take stock of where we are in history right now. Have we learned anything from this intervention? Do we want to go back to another 20 years, 30 years, another Iraq, another Taliban 2.0, another Afghanistan? And this is where Australia does have to reassess its foreign policy priorities and interests to go into another war and see our war veterans who are clearly in pain. Absolutely, but the Afghans are too. Absolutely. We have experienced collective trauma, intergenerational trauma. I've never experienced, I've never even known my grandparents. My, my parents are so foreign in terms of how they've been able to flee as refugees in the middle of the night. And in all of this, the voices of Afghans consistently and continuously gets drowned out. And I just want to be really mindful that we need to be centred, our experiences need to be centred, and our voices need to be heard right now. Well, yeah, yeah, David, yeah, David, yeah, I think yeah. something... David, I, I think something needs to be said here, and that is it, it's very hard to imagine that Australia would not have entered... The, the war in Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, despite it, it, the, the, uh, it ended up being a coalition of over 40 nations. Um, all of NATO was there. It, it, it was said to be the biggest coalition in history. The, the issue really is, is the mission creep, turning it from a war to take out al-Qaeda, to banish them for good, to eliminate their camps, to create a situation where there was some help to the development of a central government that had authority in Kabul that would not allow the Taliban to take over again. But it turned out to be a very drawn out, a very attenuated process, and the mission changed. In fact, the mission was rather vague. It was George Bush, George Bush saying, America will be there, America will never give up. It became that most dangerous, dangerous of things for America, that is, an attempt to prove its dominance. And, and as with the Vietnam War, America's leadership carried on, as the Afghanistan papers are now confirming, mm. um, carried on the war knowing it couldn't achieve any reasonable strategic objectives. Yeah. It kept the war going as it kept Vietnam going, and that really was a tragedy. Did, despite what we were told, Lydia. Could I just, um, just make an interjection? With all due respect to the need to centre Afghan voices on this, I mean, it, it's not correct to say that this was an illegal intervention. This is one that got the approval of the United Nations, was as a coalition, mm. um, as was mentioned before. Um, this was a justified intervention at the beginning that had the approval and the support of a large coalition and this, the approval of the United Nations Security Council. But as we saw, and has been already mentioned, so I won't belabor it, you know, all of that has been lost at the length of this war. It's been two decades. And at the certain point, you know, we didn't... It was clear that we were not achieving what we needed to achieve. But it's important to clarify though, that yes, initial... At the outset, it, yeah. it, it did have the UN Security Council back Backing, into the ISAF right. mission. Look, I do want to point out, uh, and Darren Chester touched on this earlier, if this discussion, uh, and particularly for veterans, but for anyone really, whether it has raised issues for you, and we know members of the Afghan community too, as Diana has has pointed out uh, the numbers for Lifeline and Open Arms are uh, there on your screen, so uh, please give those a call. Our next question comes from Nicholas Smith. The US government believed that the suppression of the Taliban over the last 20 years has been crucial in the global war on terror. If this is the case, does the rise of Taliban rule in Afghanistan mean we should expect a global increase in terror threats and potentially more coordinated attacks in the future? Lydia. Well, look, no doubt that the uh, Taliban takeover of Afghanistan is a boon to the jihadist movement and the global jihadist movement, and I think it is in a number of ways. Um, first of all, al-Qaeda never was 
completely routed from Afghanistan. Taliban always maintained a presence there. Uh, uh, excuse me, al-Qaeda always maintained a presence there. And is still there now? And is still there now, mm -hmm. according to latest intelligence estimates um, by the United Nations and by the United States and many other nations. And the relationship between the Taliban and Afghanistan is a special relationship, if I can call it that. It's one, just like we talked about, Australia and the United States maintaining that alliance. They have maintained that steadfast alliance um, in the face of, you know, military onslaught over 20 years. Additionally, they're really well integrated now into Taliban forces through, you know, intermarriages, through joint combat experience that they've had uh, together with the Taliban. So right now the Taliban is seeking to suppress its, its um, relationship with al-Qaeda, but no doubt it still exists, and that's a boon to them. Secondly, al-Qaeda is not the only um, jihadist force operating in Afghanistan right now. You also have an Islamic State presence there. And right now they may be kept in check by the Taliban or their rival al-Qaeda um, jihadist forces, but they can also take advantage of the chaos and instability in Afghanistan now to conduct attacks. attacks. And thirdly, I think it would it just basically gives credence to the strategic patience of um, jihadist actors. They've gotten the message that you can just wait out the U.S. long enough, um, and uh, they've been rewarded by their strategic patience and, um, and have gotten the Taliban, you know, uh, eager to put Islamic rule in, in Afghanistan. Yeah, look, there's this question about what it does to encourage um, jihadists globally, but Bob Carr is there also, as some have pointed out this week, an issue here about American prestige uh, being knocked around here, the humiliation of what we've seen happen with this exit giving, uh, I guess, emboldening other powers, including China? Yeah, I, I, think, I think out of this humiliation... Well, it was a humiliation. Uh, America is back, uh, the President was saying in February at the Munich Security Conference, um, sending a message to allies that after the unilateralism of the Trump years, its unpredictability, America, as a steady alliance uh, partner, could be counted on. Um, and a few months on... Asian foreign ministries, uh, including those of the, the ten nations of ASEAN, are forced to absorb the fact that America is now saying, well, um, we're not really back. We are uh, putting America first. As the President said in his, his very strong speech and very convincing speech, and I quote it, how many more generations of America's daughters and sons would we have to send to fight Afghanistan civil war when Afghan troops will not? He said, we're pulling them home, back to America. America is going home. And that's going to be taken seriously in foreign ministries around the, around the world. I think, having been embarrassed by this, there will be an instinct in American foreign policy circles to do something assertive in respect of China or perhaps in respect mm. of Russia to demonstrate to allies that America is not in some kind of retreat. But certainly, I think, I think Biden on foreign policy turf is now on the defensive in a way that he wasn't before this week. We're going to get to our final question for the night now, and it comes from Sonia Gratz. Hi, my question is for the Afghanistan experts on the panel. As an Australian, I feel responsible for the mess that's been created by the 20-year war in their country. What I'd like to know is how can we, average Australians, do something to help our fellow human beings who won't be able to leave Afghanistan no matter how much they might want to. What can we do from here that will actually have an impact? I want to get a very quick final thought, if we can, from everybody on the panel on this one. What can individuals do who are concerned about what they've seen this week? Diana. Um, I just would caution these sorts of um, buying into the narrative that somehow, um, you know, it's a very racist colonial trope that is deeply rooted in Islamophobia. Um, and so there is a lot that we can do. Don't buy into the security lens narrative, the, the fear mongering on the dog whistling to people saying that Afghans are X, Y and Z. We are people. There is so much that you can do. And Australia has a moral imperative and obligation to us um, to actually show up in our time of need because we have been sold out and let down for many decades now. So, and with all due respect, Lydia, um, to not... I mean, it's very important that at, from an Afghan to our experience to be centred. Um, but I really think that you can do so much. You can sign on to letters to your MP. You can sign the petition. We can do so much on social media under Action for Afghanistan and, and actually mobilise around this issue. Daniel, uh, Sonia's question, what can individuals do to have an impact if they're concerned? 
Okay, so for me, uh, this is going to be very veteran focused, clearly. Uh, as a veteran of Afghanistan, uh, multiple, multiple tours, I would say to the veteran community that have experienced uh, concern, certainly from the scenes from Kabul just recently, if you do need help, as Darren Chester mentioned before, open arms are there to support you. So please uh, reach out uh, if required. All right, Lydia? Well, I think a couple of things. I mean, one, open your wallets if you can. Um, you know, there's a lot of good organizations on the ground that are um, trying to do the best they can in Afghanistan. I think contacting your local MPs, particularly MPs that are currently in government, to signal that there is support in Australia for an increased humanitarian intake. And not only that, because that there will be a narrative out there saying that Australians don't want more, that they can't handle more. And so, you know, signal your support for that to counter that argument. And also keep sustained attention, because this is going to be moving, you know, the media cycle moves on, people moves on, people move on, there's no shortage of misery in the world. If you really do care about Afghanistan, keep your attention on what's going well, on. Well, it was at times over the last 20 years called the Forgotten War, uh, more than a few times. Darren Chester. Oh, thanks, David, and thank you for your panel. And my message will be a pretty simple one. Let's not talk Australia down. Let's not uh, say that this 20 years was wasted. Daniel Kieran talked about the smiles on children's faces. There was, there was hope and there was optimism. A chance was created. It hasn't uh, ended in a way we expected in recent times. Uh, but Australians can be proud of the fact that we do have a humanitarian uh, refugee program. Uh, as I said at the outset, 920,000 people have come to Australia after World War II, uh, we will do our bit, we will continue to do our bit. We are a proud nation and in its many diverse ways, we've got to keep working together, support each other. Uh, we've got a lot of our own challenges right now in Australia as well and we need to keep working together as a community and being good global citizens is part of that. And uh, finally, Bob Carr, to you. The humanitarian intake, I think that's the, uh, the most obvious obligation on us, to send a message to Canberra that we can be generous and do ourselves a favour by boosting the, uh, the intake from Afghanistan of people who are going to be struggling and, and in distress mm. and under threat. One other thing, one other thing, just a thought. For, for people, including people with veterans' backgrounds, um, people who are just thinking about what the international personality of this country should be, why not entertain the idea that before any military commitment is made in future for us to join a war elsewhere on the, on the globe, we have at least a debate in the House of Representatives. Mm. Not a binding vote, perhaps, not a debate in the, in the Senate, but at least in the People's House, a debate. Don't forget, the US Constitution says the, the, the Congress makes war and peace decisions. We don't have that constitutional provision here, but at least saying as a matter of practice, before any future military commitment, we'll have a debate in the House of Representatives. We might need another hour to debate that particular uh, idea, but we thank you for putting it forward uh, this evening, Bob Carr. That is all we have time for. Please uh, thank our panel, uh, Diana Syed, Daniel Kieran, Lydia Khalil, Darren Chester and Bob Carr. And thank you for all those uh, stories and questions that we've heard tonight. Next week, Virginia Torrioli brings you a Q&A youth special, looking at the rising rate of infection in young people. On the panel, Dr Norman Swan and paediatrician Dr Anthony Rhodes. They'll be joining students Patria Havadis and Arthur Taja. And I'll see you on Sunday morning on Insiders. The Prime Minister will be my guest. Stay safe. Good night.